Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more conversations. Steven Spielberg's The Post, a cinematic dramatization about the role of the Washington Post in the landmark 1971 Pentagon Papers case, is up for two Oscars, Best Picture of the Year and Best Actress for Meryl Streep's epic portrayal of The Post publisher Catherine Graham. The Post strikes a particular chord with its storyline, so highly relevant today's political environment, with press freedoms under such sharp attack. But how faithful is the film to the facts of the Pentagon Papers case? Is the role of the Washington Post exaggerated or overblown, or just plain fiction? Was it in fact the New York Times and not the Washington Post that took the laboring oar and the legal face down with Nixon over publication of the papers? Our guest is in a position to know. He is James Goodale, not only former general counsel and vice chair of the New York Times who helped direct the legal fight in the Pentagon Papers drama, but also the founder of this program. Jim Goodale, we're delighted to have you back with us. I'm glad to be here, Jim. Good. Now, let me ask you, did you see the movie? I saw the movie. And what did you think of it as a movie? I, I liked it. You liked the movie? Yeah, I liked it. I thought it was uh, entertaining. I thought Meryl Streep was terrific. Tom Hanks? Uh, Tom Hanks, not so terrific. Uh, Steven Spielberg directed it. How was the direction? I thought it was it was good direction. I mean, it was a you know good to very good uh, film. It was a good film, but bad history. Bad history. But to set the stage, the film deals with uh, the decision of the Washington Post, particularly its publisher Catherine Graham, to publish the Pentagon Papers. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the papers and why it was such a, a weighty decision for. Uh, well, the Pen the Pentagon Papers was forty plus volumes of history that was edited by uh, Les Gelb, former New York Times columnist, former president of Council on Foreign Relations, and it was a, it was a great history. Uh, it was huge. Uh, the problem from a publication point of view was that it was all classified, and it was all classified top secret. So the question became, is it legal to publish something that has been classified top secret? My answer to that, since I'd been in the intelligence world, was the classification stamp doesn't mean anything. I knew perfectly well because I'd stamped articles of the New York Times embedded in a study that I did, like the Pentagon Papers, top secret. Good articles. They were good articles. Some of them bad articles. <laughs> they were very good articles. That's why they're top secret. So therefore, uh, while that was my point of view, the uh, journalists and the owners of the paper were very concerned that they might go to jail. And uh, I think they had some concern, not as much concern as they thought. And uh, accordingly, it took uh, great courage to publish the Pentagon Papers. The outside attorneys of the New York Times, uh, a firm called Lord Dan Lord, no longer with us, advised the published to the New York Times that he would go to jail. And he, they also said they weren't going to look at the papers because they'd go to jail. So he was scared, scared to death. But so despite being... We'd have to shoot you if you looked at them. Yeah, that's right. So besides being uh, scared, he went ahead and published. Well, and, let's just was, uh, pause for a moment. Yeah. You had uh, received a, a letter of warning from President Nixon's Attorney General John Mitchell uh, telling the Times not to publish. Isn't that right? That is correct. The uh, Public Times published for two days, and then we got this telegram saying, uh, stop it, or we'll stop, we'll stop you in court, and here's the statute, and you may go to jail, was the implication, so forth, and so on. So it was a pretty gutsy decision, Jim Goodale, for you to advise <laughs> the powers that be at the New York Times uh, to forget about going to jail, go ahead and publish, publish or perish, or maybe go to jail later. <laughs> Well, how did you, what informed that decision? Well, uh, I think what informed it was a couple of things. Uh, emotionally, uh, Nixon uh, was an enemy of the press at that time, just as bad as Trump was. So there had been a period of time, two or three years before the Pentagon Papers, where we went through a Trump uh, situation. So when you get into that frame of mind, you start building your defenses, if you're a lawyer, what's going to happen, what's going to happen. And so as a consequence of that experience, I became very familiar with the First Amendment. Now, 
Unfortunately, how most, familiar do you have to be? It just says Congress yeah, shall make no law abridging the freedom of the press. Thought so. You would have thought so. But when <laughs> no the, law means no law. <laughs> you would have thought so. But the uh, former Attorney General of the United States, a partner of Lord Day and Lord, Herbert Brownell, very well respected, was a good guy. He said to Punch Salzberger, I'm the former Attorney General, you're going to, uh, you're going to go to jail. But Punch I Salzberger said. Salzberger was the publisher of the he, Times. He was the at publisher the time. of the New York Times. Uh, I had become steeped in the First Amendment and the basic concept of the First Amendment and the reason that we have it was to stop censorship of any kind, particularly from the courts. So what happened in the Pentagon Papers was called a prior restraint. If you looked in the history of the First Amendment, that's why it was written so that would not be permitted. So you ask me how to get so much courage. I, I knew I was going to win, <laughs> because that's what the First Amendment said. Your advice was to publish. My, advi my advice was to publish, but uh, I told them that the risk, risk was you're, gonna, you're probably going to get it joined. I don't think they really listened to me on that point. Now, uh, the papers themselves, substantively, uh, reflected badly on the two prior Democratic administrations that uh, preceded Nixon, and they were Democratic administrations. Why was Nixon so hell-bent in stopping publication? If uh, he had been the, the crafty guy we all think of him as, why didn't he say, you know, let it rip? And well, uh, then I can criticize Johnson and Kennedy and say it's all their fault. You want to you wanna know why? Yeah. He was ignorant. <laughs> but more, than, more to the point, his lawyer was ignorant. Now, his lawyer was John Mitchell. Who went to jail later. Well, so, we, we know about him. Salzburg, he went to, Salzburger <laughs> didn't go to jail. Mitchell went to jail. Mitchell went to jail, <laughs> right. And he uh, had the eminent, uh, an eminent career in New York of being a bond lawyer. And he called uh, Nixon and told him that it had been, it, joining the newspaper had happened before, so we'll just, go, uh, we'll just go ahead and do it. Bad advice. So Nixon, that's the original reason he did it. Uh, in large part, but he also was goaded by Henry Kissinger into doing it because uh, Kissinger said to him, you've got to stop them or you'll be perceived as being weak. <laughs> Off it went. So how many days did uh, the Times publish excerpts of the Pentagon Papers? Well, they published a three, to answer your question. They published two before they got the telegram. I told the Times, somebody sends you a telegram, you don't stop publishing, so they published a third time. And then they got enjoined. They were enjoined preliminarily by the, the district court in New York. So they stopped publishing. They stopped publishing. Enter the Washington Post. The Washington Post, right. <laughs> Which is what the movie is about. Is oh, it? yeah, it's it's right. as if none of this really happened. Enter the Washington Post. Enter the Washington Post. Uh, Ellsberg uh, had a. Oh, who was Ellsberg? Who was Ellsberg? Dan Ellsberg was the person who leaked the Pentagon Papers. He, he was, was a leaker. He was the leaker. Bad guy. Uh, well, I didn't think so, but uh, he... Didn't, didn't Kissinger say he was the most, oh, yeah, dan the most dangerous, dangerous man? Dangerous man in America. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but that's, a, that's another issue, how you know, bad are leaks. He worked at Rand, Rand Corporation, right. and uh, the Pentagon Papers, which had, I don't know, 15 or 20 uh, editions, so to speak, or copies, I should say, was given to the Rand Corporation. Why? Rand Corporation advising the government with respect to the Vietnam War. He saw them, he copied them, he put them in a satchel, he walked out, no one stopped him, and he started showing them to various people, hoping that he would get Congress, for example, to release it and he wouldn't have any liability. He, however, had failed, and he gave the uh, copies to uh, Neil Sheehan, or made them available to New Neil Sheehan. Reporter for the New York Times. Neil Sheehan was a reporter of the New York Times as part of the Pulitzer Prize winning team, of which I was a member. And so the Times won a Pulitzer Prize for the Pentagon right. Papers publication. The uh, Washington Post did not. Well, yeah, people seem to forget that. They seem to forget that. Now, uh, the, the Washington Post won a Pulitzer for Watergate, but this had nothing to do with Watergate. So uh, the uh, Neil Sheehan's a reporter for the Times, and he was, uh, and didn't the Times uh, weren't they worried whether these uh, papers that had been leaked to them by Ellsberg were authentic? That was the big question for the, for the Times because Ellsberg's, quotes Ellsberg today, you say the name, most people know who he is, but then 
he didn't mean anything to the New York Times, and the Times had to assume that someone from the State Department, I say, had just put him under one's arm and walked out. And the risk was, first of all, that they might be fake. Uh, secondly, that they violated national security. So those were big risks for the Times, which it had to deal with, and it took three months for the Times to deal with that issue. What about possession of stolen property? Is that, uh, well, is I, that an issue? I didn't think that was an issue. If you look at the uh, law, if your audience is interested in the law. Well, uh, we're supposed to have a rule of law. It's supposed to be relevant. <laughs> it seemed that the only uh, law that applied was with respect to the uh, theft of jeeps and tangible property like that, but not copying documents. So uh, I didn't think there was any law that... Jeep is intangible property? You mean theft of... of I mean, the, the th in, uh, it could cover theft. Possession of, of stolen goods could uh, cover intangible property. Well, the theft of a copyrighted book or a, was this stolen property when you make a copy? Uh, yeah, the well, property's still there. Anyway, so you didn't think that was an issue. I did not think that was. <laughs> an issue. They might have gone to jail <laughs> for possession of stolen property, even if you were right about all the other issues. You advised them to publish. Neil Sheehan had spent how many months doing research into whether they were authentic? Well, that was three months. Three months. How do you determine whether a document is authentic? Well, what the, the Times did during that three-month period was they assembled a huge staff, a couple of librarians, put them in the Hilton Hotel, and they started looking through and at every book that had been written about the Vietnam War. And they took every factual statement of any importance and try to connect it to a published uh, fact that was similar. In other words, they're trying to figure out whether all the material in the papers have been published before. And they did, can, did they, they can, find that much of this classified information was really in the public domain? Anyway? It was all. It was all in the public all domain. All in the public, pretty much all in the public domain. And uh, how much of it was uh, fact and uh, how much of it was opinion? A lot of it was uh, opinion rather than fact, wasn't it? Well, uh, it was history. History. And so you get the facts put in order, which reflects uh, an opinion. But is an opinion classifiable? I don't know. You get to the you get to the point where the classification is, becomes really rather silly when you're dealing with public domain material that's sourced to the New York Times, and you ask yourself, it was sourced to the New York Times, by the way, that uh, how can a government come in and penalize somebody from publishing what they've ever published? Now, that's not everything that was published by uh, this classified history. There are other sources, but that was the guiding principle. Now, what was the government's position? The government's position was it uh, affected national security. It was it would be well the big issue, the big irreparable issue. harm to the public if it was published. I mean, and, and you had cases like uh, uh, the publication of, uh, of ships sailing dates in wartime, and the Supreme Court said that that could be enjoined because uh, that's classified, and uh, we have to protect the state secrets. Uh, why wasn't this like that, and uh, why was it? Well, there, was, there, were, there were two... Something that the public was entitled to. There were two uh, ways for the government to get you. In the telegram that they had sent to the New York Times, they said that you were violating the Espionage Act, which, by the way, is for espionage. Right. And that's why they tried to stop the Times from publishing. But when you think about it, if uh, somebody leaks to another person, that's hardly espionage because there's no delivery to a foreign power. So, so then we have it, no uh, official S uh, Secrets Act as they do in England. That's right. And we don't have an official Secrets Act because we have the First Amendment and the UK, the Brits, don't have it. Uh, we have the First Amendment. So the government then had to attack us on the First Amendment. It is true that there was a case that implied that if you publish the date of a sailing ship that uh, you could stop that under the First Amendment. Uh, that issue, however, had never been decided by the court. It was off to the side, lawyers call it dictum. So even though that was a uh, uh, articulation of what might happen by the Supreme Court, it had never decided that issue. So there was an opening under the First Amendment to make an argument, in this case, that you couldn't penalize the New York Times for publishing the Pentagon Papers.
Okay, so uh, you get served with uh, a, a temporary restraining order, and uh, you have to go to court, and you appear before Judge Gerfine in the Southern District of New York, and uh, the government is trying to enjoin you, and you're trying to resist it, and there's a hearing, and what happened? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I, f I found all this ra rather amusing because they... Well, what you, you weren't going to jail. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going to jail. What happened was the government comes in and they put somebody on the stand to say why these were classified, these documents. And it turned out that he didn't really classify them. His girlfriend had classified them. And his girlfriend worked some other part of the, of the government. And he couldn't explain why he had put a class, uh, classified stamp on us. So that was the first thing that happened. That was known as an, opening, an open hearing where the uh, government lawyers came in and people hissed at them because that was the Vietnam War protest era. Then after that, there was this secret, mysterious, I'm making fun of it, but I wasn't, I wasn't no, making no, fun of it. That, that was a secret, mysterious hearing down in the basement of the federal uh, court building where they pulled down the shades and they went through the same thing. That's where we used to watch pornography when we were assisting you as attorney. <laughs> oh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> See if it was pornographic. I didn't see. <laughs> I didn't know there was uh, such, such a room. I was, I was impressed. Uh, so they went through the same argument again. And this is why this is classified. And I sat there looking at the judge, and they would come. Every time they came up with another reason, he would look at them like saying, what the hell are you telling me? And basically, they went into the secret area and they couldn't prove any more that there were secrets in there that damaged national security than they were able to in the hearing that proceeded, which was an open court. So while you're doing all this and these people are testifying and uh, they're saying, that I didn't do it, my girlfriend did, uh, the Washington Post is publishing. Well, uh, Ellsberg uh, got a hold of the copies. He, as I started to say earlier, he, had a whole coterie of friends, and they started Xeroxing them and shipping, sh getting ready to ship them out. And the first person, the uh, first entity that the uh, group uh, submitted their papers to was the Washington Post. And so the Washington Post, they didn't get all of them, but they got a big hunk uh, from Ellsberg, who called one of the New York, uh, Washington Post reporters, and uh, then they had to decide whether to publish them or not. Well, what steps did they take to uh, satisfy themselves that the papers were authentic? Uh, they didn't take any, really. Right. I mean, they spent eight hours uh, trying to do what the New York Times had done in three months. And so I think, basically, they didn't take any time. They just took the fact that the Times had published it, and they could publish it. Well, in the movie, there's that uh, wonderful scene where they send a, 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 a cub reporter posing as a delivery boy into the offices of the New York Times, and he's asking around, are they authentic, are they authentic? And they all say yes. And then he rushes back and says that they're gonna, uh, they are authentic and they're going to publish it unless we publish it. And uh, they published it. Did any of that happen? No. No. That's it's pure like Hollywood. It's Spielberg pure Hollywood. Hollywood. Pure okay. Hollywood. Okay. So, uh, I mean... Uh, I couldn't wander into the press room, into the city room of the New York Times well, and, and look over Abe Rosenthal's shoulder and see what was on his mind. Well, you know, you've got to, uh, you got to give the Spielberg some license to uh, make an entertaining, entertaining film. Uh, but, but he made up so much and put the whole matter out of kilter that it's hard to say the film's authentic. Maybe entertaining, but I don't think it's authentic. Well, then the screenwriter, uh, Ms. Hannah, uh, said uh, after she read an article you wrote in the, in the Daily Beast in which you debunked the, the movie, <laughs> really marvelous article, <laughs> she said, well, this movie isn't about the, the Pentagon Papers and the Post at all. The, the movie is about the uh, women in the workplace and the courage of Catherine Graham in deciding to publish. Uh, as, <laughs> so what truth is there to that? Well, she went on uh, a program and said, this is the Washington Post story. New York Times has its own story. But how about his story? Right. Yeah, it didn't have uh, anything to do with uh, history. Well, the Post, I mean, the, the producer got himself, uh, Steven Spielberg, in a real mess on all of this. And they first, the first thing that happened was Spielberg put out a promo 
saying they were going to uh, do a movie about the Post and the Papers. Everybody screamed and yelled. So now it was no longer about the Post and the Papers. It was about the Post. Then they said, it's not about the Papers, and it's really not about the Post. As such, it's about Kay Graham. So Spielberg had to retract, redo uh, the theory of the movie. And then he left out, the, the script had left out the New York Times. And the script had had Kay Graham arguing before the Supreme Court. <laughs> so Spielberg, Spielberg and his producer said, hey, you know, that, that doesn't, doesn't make any sense. We'll have to have the New York Times in it. So then they went and hired another writer. And the writer was the one who, written, who had done the script for the Boston Globe uh, story on Spotlight, won the Pulitzer Prize. The new writer came in and added on the New York Times part. So if you look at the movie, it starts with the New York Times, but it's just an add-on. And then it goes to the Post, and the Post comes out the screen, screaming triumphant publisher. Okay, so in your view, did uh, K. Graham show courage in deciding to publish? I mean, they, they make it appear in the movie that this was the first major decision she had to make as publisher of the Post, but in fact, she'd been there eight years. Uh, she wasn't <laughs> new to major decisions. <laughs> and uh, she uh, decided to publish. Now, she did have a uh, pending public offering, which might have been adversely affected if... Uh, uh, the government had indicted the Post or if they'd taken some terrible action against the Post. Well, uh, uh, but, uh, So there was some courage involved, maybe uh, less courage than was involved yeah. with Sulzberger. You know, of course there's some courage because you're, you're publishing uh, classified uh, documents, but the idea that they were assuming the risk of going to jail and all that sort of thing was easy for her to assume, and there wasn't much in the movie about that decision. Easy? She knew the Times had done it, and she knew the Times had done it with legal advice. So that wasn't a real problem for her. On authenticity, uh, she knew the Times wasn't going to publish something that was fake. And so those two uh, items, which were very difficult for the New York Times and the basis of their decision, really didn't apply to her. Uh, what did apply to her and not to the Times was, as you said, she had a public offering in the movie. The public offering is depicted as providing money for reporters at the Washington Post. In other words, if I don't do this offering, I won't have enough money to stay in, stay in business. Well, I decided to go and look at the offering and see what it was really for. A majority of the offering was to pay her estate taxes and also to pay off executives who've gotten huge million dollar options and 30 years ago a million dollars was a million dollars and they had no one there was no one to buy them out and that would have meant that the treasury of the Washington Post had to be used to buy out their key employees so uh, they thought of this idea well we won't do that we'll have the public so the public's money comes and buys them off that's what it was all at and by the way but Kay, she wanted the public offering to go through no but uh, you know what she didn't even want to have the public offering you know why she didn't want to have the public offering because that meant her family had to give up some control to the public, because the public would then have a border, and she really didn't want to do it. And uh, her advisor, who was a New York lawyer, as we are, formerly at Cravath Swain and Moore, which is supposed to be the pinnacle of the legal profession in New York, Fritz Beebe, said, hey, you gotta do it, because we ain't got no money to pay <laughs> off those employees. So she really didn't want to do this, do this too much, however, uh, she had agreed to do it, and she was told that it was a possibility the whole thing would fall apart. And so that wasn't an easy decision to make, whether it was courageous in the same extent that Punch Salzberger's decision was courageous, I would argue not, but it, it, it wasn't easy. Okay, so the Times case uh, rolls on. The district court denies the injunction, but there's a stay. It goes up to the Second Circuit. That Some judges think you should publish. Some judges don't think you should publish. <laughs> they kick the can down the road, and you have them exactly where you want the government in the United States Supreme Court. Now, you go there for the argument in the United States Supreme Court. What were your emotions as you listened to the judges and you listened to uh, the lawyers argue the case? Well, I can't say that I wasn't a little scared. <laughs> I was, this, the Supreme Court is such a, a, magic, a majestical place. Uh, here we'd gone from... Vietnam protesters hissing at the judges and crowds of people following us. And it was a noisy two weeks. All of a sudden, you're in 
total quiet. And you realize that the dignity of the court is not going to look at this thing that you'd live with for a period of time. And you didn't know how it was going to, you didn't know how it was going to come out, which we, okay, had, so the, we had a theory. The argument's over. Did you feel you'd won it? I thought we'd won it. You thought you'd won it. I took and a vote. I took a vote, however, of the others who were with me and the esteemed Floyd Abrams voted you'd lost. <laughs> and when you learned, um, I guess a few weeks later, that you'd won the case, uh, what was it, seven to two? Uh, 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 well, six, six to three. Six to three. Won the case six to three. Three judges were against you. That's Wanted right. you to go to With jail. Six were for six, six were for you. So, all right, six to three, you won the case. And uh, what were your emotions at that time? Hey, I was pretty happy. Ha pretty happy. I was pretty happy. James Goodale was pretty happy. <laughs> so I have a question for you, James Goodale, because we've come to the end of our time, and the question is, is the post, the movie, fake news? Uh, yes. It is. <laughs> James Goodale, thank you so much for coming by, and thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. All the best, and take care. <laughs>